Thank you very much. Colleagues at the head table, members of the diplomatic corps, colleague members of parliament, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, may I first thank the Guyana Manufacturing and Services Association for the kind invitation to speak here tonight. I have heard Mr. Norman McLean speaking earlier of the plan of the GMSA to host a series of activities similar to this one with a view of focusing on the economy and I think it's commendable. But I've always been accused of irreverence, so I suspect their motives are not purely altruistic, because when I look at the price of the ticket to come here, that this is, must be impacting significantly on the bottom line of the GMSA. So, Thank you very much for that. <laughs> So with a state of economy, maybe as ours now, the next one, when the president comes, I hope it will be at a lower cost. The, my, when I decided to speak here over the past two days, um, uh, since I did not do much pre preparation, I, I canvassed many people that I know and colleagues from the private sector, and I asked, what are the things that you would like to hear about? What would you want a speech to focus on? So I could be more pointed rather than speak on things that are not of major concern to the private sector. And to my surprise, many of the issues have to deal with the mood of the country, not just the economy. So people wanted to hear about the points we've been making about the erosion of constitutional rights because those can affect the environment in which they practice their livelihoods. They wanted to hear about SARA bill and how it will impact them, the private sector, particularly not the politicians. They wanted to hear about parking meters and of course the VAT, oil and gas, etc. So, I plan to, in a brief way, touch on some of those items. But before I do so, I thought that I should share some random thoughts with you. Because it's difficult in, a, in an environment like ours to really go through a proper economic analysis of the state of the economy in the absence of data. And so, trying to seek out data to see if I could succeed in painting a picture of what's happening now and how that would evolve over the year, particularly impacting some of the variables that people want to, are, are of primary concern to them, like the exchange rate and maybe interest rates and how those will move in the future because that seems to be a major preoccupation now. I found that it is, there is a paucity of data. And even the end of the year data that we are accustomed to when the budget is presented, we cannot rely on it because the budget was presented in November. And so a lot of the 2016 figures that we have seen that we're using as a basis for estimating trends. There were best estimates as to what will happen by the 31st of December. And so, from what we've been hearing anecdotally, that a lot of those, or the picture painted by the Minister of Finance using best estimates, has changed in a major way. For example, spendings that in the budget that were thought to have been, well, expenditure that have been done, we found that checks 
lying in, say, the regions, in the regional administrations totaling close to a billion dollars, had to be returned to the Treasury. So that would have been estimated as spent. But when the figures are revised, you will see the ex government expenditure go down by a billion dollars. And that's, that's just one example. So it's very hard to make firm predictions about where things are going in the absence of data um, per last year, or verified data. And then for the first quarter of this year, it's almost impossible to get information about what is happening in the real sector, the monetary sector, balance of payments, etc. So I just want to, without having the basis of the data, talk about some trends that are worrying to me. Points, some of the points I've made already in the parliament and elsewhere. But just to, to use some of the, what we have now to illustrate what I mean. And so take the, because there are two things that I'm worried about. The pressure on the exchange rate, and as I said before, interest rates. So let's take, go to page 689 of the estimates in 2070. And you will see a table there that speaks about gross domestic expenditure. So it's divided into consumption and investment. And I'm not going to give you the figures I'll just give you the percentage of how domestic our investment was financed in Guyana for several years, and you will see a trend. So in 2012, 44% of domestic or in national investment was financed from domestic savings, and 55.6 from foreign uh, sources. In 2014, 57% was spent from um, domestic sources and 42%. I'm, I'm rounding up for 40, 58 and, and 42% from foreign sources. In 2015, 88.8% of national investment was financed from domestic sources and 112 from foreign. In 2016, 90.2% of national investment was financed from domestic sources and 9.8 from foreign sources. And in 2070, the projection is 91.5% from domestic sources and 8.5 from foreign. So what this shows is that our national investment progressively, and it's a sharp progression, is being financed from domestic savings, not from foreign capital inflows. What's the implication of this? One, if it will, over time, deplete local savings, and so once local savings become scarcer, interest rates will go up, the only reason that has not happened now is because there is very little demand for credit because of the state of the economy. So that's one, so that would put severe upward pressures on interest rates. And secondly, the demand for foreign currency because to import machinery and all of the, the things that go into investment, national investment, will go up, uh, um, the, that demand will be severe. So that will put pressure on our balance of payment, on our exchange rate. This is a budget number. You look at it, it tells a big picture of where we are headed, where we are headed. And the president was forced to, to admit that foreign direct investment is drying up. And I come to why in the future. Yes, so that's one of the things that will put severe pressure on exchange rate and future interest rates. 
Let's go quickly to the balance of payment, what we have data. In the balance of payment, goal, goal moved from 469.8 million US dollars of exports in 2014 to $778 million in 2016. And it's projected to go to nearly 800 million in 2017. So big increase in gold exports. Should, on the other hand, rice declined from 249 million to 182 in 2016, from 2014 to 2016. Sugar from 88 to 67. Bauxite from 124 to 100. Timber 53 to 40. So almost these are the five major areas that are disaggregated and then you have another category in our balance of payment. And four of the five, five have seen a significant decline in exports, at least in U.S. dollars term. So less supply, gold has offset it. The, the, the only one that has shown a big increase is gold. On the, on the import side, well, let's, let's look at on the import side, fuel imports were $573 million in 2014, fell to $367 million in 2015, $337 in 2016. And it projected to go up to 433 in 2017. The improvement in our balance of payment has relied on two things alone. The drop in fuel prices, we saved a couple of hundred million dollars, and gold prices skyrocketed between 2014 to 2016 by a few hundred million dollars. Everything else has deteriorated. Now, fuel prices are very volatile, as you can see. Already between 2016 to 2017, it's going up back by $100 million. And gold earnings, because a significant part of this earning <coughs> is from, from large companies. So it gets recorded in the exports. But what flows back to the country is very different because if a large company exports $100 million of gold, often they only bring back money to pay local wages and salaries, buy supplies here, pay the royalty and other taxes. The rest of the money is, is spent abroad. They operate in enclavic ways. And so they don't lend to major foreign currency inflow back. So you see 100 million of exports, but you're not getting 100 million of foreign currency coming back from those because they operate in an enclavic way. So what I'm saying here is that these, if you look at it, foreign direct investment fell from $205 million to this year in 2014, it's projected at $91 million, fell to one or three. Net private transfers, that includes remittances, from $457 million um, in 2014, it's now, last year it was 274, big reduction too. So big reduction in foreign direct investment, big reduction in, in remittances and net, other net private transfers, big reduction, huge reduction in gold, bauxite, sugar, rice. The only, on the export side, gold has gone up, and then on the import side, there are savings in fuel, and both are volatile. So when you look at long-term sustainability of the balance of payment, you'll have major difficulties. And that is why, that is why you're seeing real growing pressures on the exchange rate. And added to this, because of the crisis of confidence, more and more people are going to start 
switching money from G dollars to US dollars. And so the demand for transactional purposes will go up. We've seen a growth in import. But when you talk to people anecdotally, many of them are bringing in less containers. And so I was thinking, why is this so? And a lot of it has to do with the increased valuations by GRA. So it is the, your reduction in the number of containers coming in. But it's seen as a growth in, in imports because GRA bumps up the valuation. People who bring in a container now complain that their containers are revalued 30, 40% capriciously. And so you think it creates the impression that more imports are taking place, some veneer of, of prosperity that things are happening. But in real sense, it's a, a financial tr transaction. And so given all of this picture, people are concerned. They, that is why the exchange rate it's about 230 something. I know banks that are buying currency for $230 and selling them for $230 something, or $3. And we've already started moving back to exchange control. There's no deep money in the banking system. And everyone is projecting this because things are going to get progressively worse. And I'll tell you why. That it, it, it can head to 300 to 1. Now, what that means if it heads to 300 to 1 or 250 to 1? There are two things. One, this could be good for the exporting sectors. It makes your exports more competitive. But you've seen our five exports, the major ones. But so I believe that an exchange rate benefit that is the depreciation which will make exports more competitive, will not have any or any major impact on our exporting sector in terms of giving them a boost because there are supply side constraints. A whole range of constraints that would not allow the production response. So take for example, rice. Rice sector now, rice exports could become more competitive globally because of the changing exchange rate. But the rice farmers now have to pay in MMA area, if you're producing there, they now have to pay taxes on their inputs, which they didn't have before. That is the, the chemicals and a whole range of other things. They now have their taxes moved from 3,005 that's a DINI and the land charge, to $15,000 per acre. They have to now pay about $4 million more on a combine if they import it or a tractor because there's a VAT on, the VAT now has been placed on heavy duty equipment. So that will negate, when they have to do that, all the, the benefits that they may get from a depreciated currency. It would negate it. Forestry now, let's, let's look at forestry. How will forestry respond? So I just told, Chan was telling me, that there are now manicole palm, logs, staves, lumber, piles, poles, plywood, shingles are all now vatable. Their building materials have gone, they become vatable, now sand and and stone and concrete blocks, etc. So it will kill any production response. Not I, in the forestry sector. You forget what I said about the other. That will kill construction and housing. But that will kill any benefit. And with all of these silly regulations that they are bringing in, that will harm the industry. How do you? penalize value added. The president speaks about value added. And then all the value added activities here, shingles and staves and lumber, cut lumber, are all now vatable. You kill, you take away the incentive. So they're not going to benefit from the supply response called in occasion by, by a cheaper currency or a depreciated currency. The gold mining sector. How are the small ones going to benefit from this? When now, although this should boost the sector, 
the, the depreciated currency, they now have to pay the 2% final tax. That is no longer 2%. They have the tributary tax has increased by 100%. They, uh, and a whole range, the, the VAT on heavy duty equipment affects them adversely. So the miners are worried. They're worried about it, and many of them may not even make it to production. Many may go to production, so it doesn't matter whether the exchange rate is going. How are you going to benefit on the sugar side from a supply response? When you're closing the sugar industry itself and shrinking production rather than expanding it in, in an, a time when your exports become more global, be competitive. So the benefits of a depreciated currency will not affect that. But what, on the other hand, are we going to lose? So we're not benefiting significantly. We have a high import content. And so every time you have uh, exchange rate depreciation, you have cost of living increasing, inflation. And the minister predicted a 2.5% inflation. But that is with some assumptions about the exchange rate. That will change significantly. In fact, I doubt because sometimes they're pig-headed. Pig-headed. They will not rework the numbers showing the impact of a depreciating currency now on all the macro variables. But it will have significant, significant impact. And so what will happen? Inflation, cost of living go up, so you lose welfare. It will wipe out the fixed income earners. So they boast about the, the, the three years that uh, cumulatively you got about maybe 20 something percent salary increase. But already the rate has depreciated by maybe 10 percent. So in terms of US dollars, the salary has been reduced in value by 10 percent. And if it gets to 300, it would wipe out the, the purchasing power of the local currency and, and all of those public servants, people particularly in fixed income, will fare, bear the brunt, brunt of this. So that is important. So I've demonstrated that you're going to have real pressures on the exchange rate. And no amount of talking by the central bank, no amount of moral suasion can change the reality in the banking system. The markets are not clearing. The markets are not clearing, regardless of what they demand for. And you can't bully the bankers into keeping the rate constant, the posted rate constant, when the rate at which they are trading, or most of the transactions are taking place, are significantly higher. That's deluding yourself and the country. It's not allowing the markets to clear. And this is what they're engaged in doing, bullying people. So uh, the bankers are told that you better keep the rates there or more regulation. So two exchange control measures already put in place when the, the um, private pe people protest on, the, the protesters on private education and VAT, rather than deal with the issue of VAT separately from income tax, if they're tax dodgers and delinquents, go after them for corporate tax evasion. Don't equate that with the VAT. The VAT they collect is on behalf of the parents. The parents are paying the VAT, but they said, we'll go come after you, the private people, because you dare go on the street to protest against us. This is what happens. So the people protesting the parking meter told that they're tax dodgers too. We have to go after you. When the miners were saying, we'll come out on the street, they got big assessments from the GRA. And the GRA is increasingly being used as a political tool. I'm going to come to that a little bit later. Increasingly used to bully people, to force them into compliance. And so this is what's happening with the bankers too. But these things can't remain hidden for very long because the markets will move. And they're, a black market will develop again for currency. People are not going to trade their money at the posted rate if they can get $20, $30 more for one US dollar. And so 
this it's only a matter of time before this happens and we have not heard this government try to address it i i thought maybe i'm a politician and i tend to to be partisan i want the pbp to get back in office so that's my job working towards that so maybe i don't give them a fair chance of presenting what they their economic policy is. But I've asked many people who are supposed to be not partisan, not politicians, technical people, and they're just as lost as I am about where the country is heading and a clear vision for taking it there. Because it just doesn't exist. And it's these hodgepodge policies that we get every single day. So, if you look at the growth rates for this year and last year and this year, they are very anemic. And therefore, the growth rates are not gonna, and very optimistic, because already, from what I know, that the sugar growth that they had projected and some of the sectors like manufacturing, etc., construction, that projected at 5%, that's not gonna happen this year. So when they forecast a 3.8% growth in, in, in the GDP, it could very well take place because of mining, um, the gold mines, but every other sector would decline. So I painted a benign picture of our balance of payment. The trend, the bank, and, and with the benign picture, there's so much pressure already on the exchange rate. If you paint a, a picture of the balance of payment evolving on the basis of what we know anecdotally, then it gets worse. It gets worse. Because the real sector can't support that what's happening here. The real sector cannot support what's happening here. So I thought I'd just share a few random thoughts about that, the exchange rate and, 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 and some management, etc. Issues. Um, maybe I should move on to a few other issues now at this time. Um, so, the value added tax. If you look at the VAT, the VAT was in 2015. Can you get the water, please? Just pass that. I drink it just from the bottle. Right, thanks. Yeah. I'm dehydrated. Yeah, thank you. So the value added tax in 2015 was about 15.9 billion dollars collected for 2016. So they argued, not, not 15, 35.9 billion. I thank you, Grace. You look at me like that and I realize I said the wrong thing. It's 35.9 billion. So the two percent, the reduction by two percentage point from 16 to, to 40 would cause a loss of about $4 billion in VAT revenue. But the actual collection is projected to be $45 billion. So the tax measures in this budget are equivalent to $14 billion on a base of 35, what was 35. So it is close to a 40% increase in the VAT, if you look at it from that perspective, collections will increase on that base. People don't look at it, because when you look at the net of the 2%, and then look at, at where it's going, and I would say to you that that figure is grossly underestimated, because the government agencies themselves become vatable now. And when you net out their payments and the other non vatable items in the government's expenditure, you're left with maybe $180 billion, $170 billion, even if it's $100 billion. Even if it's $100 billion. And that's, that's like being ultra kind to them. 14% of that on lo alone is $14 billion, leaving out VAT on everything else. And so that is why I argue that the figure is underestimated significantly. And in the budget, I said, if they charge a VAT on government agencies as they should, because they made it 
uh, VATABLE agencies now, we're talking about 20 something billion dollars, maybe 25 billion dollars of new VAT collections on a base of 35. And this is money that comes out of people's pockets. This is disposable income. It comes from the private sector, it makes it bad, but it comes from poor people too. It affects welfare, it affects spending, and, in spe and it will lead to a shrinkage of, of the economy. And somehow, there is this philosophy in government that if, if that they were placed there to take money from people and intermediate it through the Ministry of Finance, that they don't know how to spend the money. So they have to not expand economic activities because there not been a single plan to assist any sector to grow. It's all about taxes there, taxing them and regulating and bullying people. So not about expanding the economy, not about expanding future sources of revenue and employment and, and everything else, GDP growth, but about milking what has already been created. Milking it and then spending it, taking it into the government and spending it often on things that do not lead to either social capital formation or economic capital formation. That is, lead to things that will enhance the well-being of our economy in the future. Wasted expenditure. And they are driven by this philosophy. And it is the wrong philosophy. It happened in the past, it led us to rule. This is a minister who's proud to talk about the borrowings. I have to borrow $38 billion this year. You know, and just, just like, like that. And the borrowing often comes from the domestic sources too, crowding out the pri pri private sector. So it's a taxation, it's a borrowing. They don't need to push the level of expenditure that high that they, they're doing. Leave, support private expenditure rather than displace them. So the, the, you get the same overall level of expenditure in the economy, but it's, it's done in the private sector, mainly, not by switching. And then especially with their absorptive capacity, with the incompetence in this government, they will just rake in the taxes and not implement the projects. And so you have, you have a, a drop in aggregate demand, overall demand, because of their incompetence. And so this is, this is major, because if this philosophy persists, then they will get more and more desperate. So the SARA bill now, this is not about going after the PPP. They could, I said to the president when I was walking out State House, I said, you could have named the bill, former um, ministers and former president bill, and we would support it. But take the private sector out of it. You come after us because they can throw their words at us. But what, what they have done now is to create a bill that is not necessary. You can prosecute anyone now for any criminal offense that they have. You can even pursue, but maybe the Civil Forfeiture Act aspect needs strengthening in our local legislation. But you can go after people with the existing laws that you have shown over the last few days. They do not need that. But the ominous thing is this director now is a, a corporate soul or soul corporate, etc. He reports to no one. He has powers that are even greater than that of the president. He takes over, he could take over the powers of the police commissioner, the governor of the central bank, the minister of finance, the head of GRA, every one of these agencies. And capriciously act, he, knows, he reports to no one. And guess how they're appointed? By a simple majority in parliament. And you know who has the majority. Now the current crop of leaders being a total waste every, every time. Saru has become a unit to shake down people. They go to the private sector. Now this, this unit has no legal basis in law that exists in the office of the president. No legal basis in law. And I'm surprised people haven't challenged that as yet. So they 
have been making statements about who is corrupt and who, who they're coming after. And this is the signals I said to the president, the signals of destroying the economy. And I said it here before, if your an agency that works out of your office says that every tall building is the proceeds of corruption, that the biggest bank in Guyana is doing money laundering, not a basis for doing it at all, the basis for money laundering. The biggest bank in Guyana is doing money laundering. That this country loses $306 billion a year through corrupt practices, half of its gross domestic product. Then who will want to come and invest in a country like that, that is operated or maintained on drug proceeds? Last week, they added, well, they just repeated that we export, we smuggle 15,000, Eric Phillips said 15,000 ounces of gold per week. If you multiply it by 52 weeks, that gives you about a billion dollars a year at the current billion US dollars a year. And they can't find a single person in two years. So a single person who has done this, they've been there two years. It is these statements that drive fear. People think we're going, and they have no legal basis. So those are the same people now who will be given unlimited powers to come after you. So imagine you get a property, forget the private politicians. The private person now gets a property. He, he bought something five years ago, six years ago. If they go to check your tax records, and you can justify based on your tax payment the, how you bought this property, and then you know who would be doing the analysis. It's some of the dunderheads too. And then they, the thing is, they, would, they, would, they can then seize it because they can say it's state assets. So every private person, every citizen who has accumulated any property in the last 10 years can now be subjected to investigation by Saru on the basis of this bill that they are passing. And if they assert, they say, well, you didn't pay the appropriate taxes, they can seize your property, claiming it's state property. I'm just using one provision. This, look at what they did. A few days ago, they don't even have any powers. The Saru group went to a businessman place and, and asked him for for um, the, some duty-free letter. That's a GRA matter. Have nothing to do with it. Then they took another person for questioning, another businessman in the office of the president. Now, can you imagine an ordinary businessman going into the compound of the office of the president to be questioned by a unit that has no legal powers? No legal powers, the intimidation the fair element, and they have no jurisdiction over it. This is what is happening. And I saw today the British High Commission said that, <coughs> the, what's his name, the Sittlington or something like that, is there to advise Soku. I know two businessmen that he has no operational mandate. He raided the home with Soku of two businessmen was there even counting money of at least two businessmen in their homes. And he has no operational, this is what we hear, the nonsense. But we're going to deal with that at the appropriate moment, at the appropriate time. And so what, I, what I'm saying, they're encouraged, they're using this this UN Convention on Corruption as a cover for a piece of legislation that's unconstitutional that will make every single Guyanese insecure. Every single. Forget the politicians. The politicians have a way of fighting their, their own battles. We will fight our battles, but we're worried about the, all the citizens of this country. This is not a bill about former politicians. This is a bill to intimidate people and they will get more desperate as the economy shrinks and they're going to try to squeeze milk out of stone, going after people.
to get money for the state apparatus. That is the big fear. Uh, that is that is the worry about Sarah. I'm sure that the others would have more detail and presentations about Christopher Ram and the others. I saw he did some things um, there about how pernicious it is and how dangerous it is for the future of our democracy, etc. We are also worried because it's becoming all a pattern. And when people's rights are not protected, then the society becomes unstable and they, it loses energy. We saw it in the past when there was no democracy here. We lost practically half of our people, some of our best minds. We lost our entire middle class almost. We lost good entrepreneurial skills. They fled this country. We thought we had gone past that era. And then I was requested to send a list to the president in keeping with an article of the Constitution that I thought was the law had been settled because no PNC member who there have been in opposition, including Mr. Hoyt, had ever questioned the article, its meaning, or the people that we have put. We never questioned the people that were placed on the list that came to the presidents under the PVP era, and we always chose people, including from the first, uh, on every occasion from the first list. And Mr. Granger himself was on two of those lists. So to our surprise, the president changed the, changes the interpretation. And he says, I'm clear about the interpretation. And not because Mr. Hoyt, by implication, who was a senior counsel, did that, it's right. So he is now, he then said, you can only, your list is not appropriate because it does not, it should only have former judges, judges or people eligible to be appointed judges. And it has none. And they forgot that Mr. Ram is eligible to be appointed as a judge. In fact, at the last meeting, Basil Williams said the list was deficient because it did not include anyone from the first category. And when I said that no, it's not so, because we had Mr. Ram on the list, who was eligible in the first category, he then, I said, you've just defeated your own argument, and he stuttered as usual. He's a, anyhow, let me don't say anything, but with him and law, it's like, oh. So, so this, is, this is it, and look at the charade now. The hoops we have to jump through to get something that was settled, and we believe that it is for a purpose. We believe that this situation, which may be undesirable, the tree tree formula, but it worked in Guyana, and it was carefully crafted to give a balance, tree from the opposition, tree from the government, and then the two sides collaboratively would have to agree on the seventh person, the chairperson. So it could only come through a consultative process because if the president unilaterally appoints, then the delicate balance at GCOM would be lost. And that was not the intention of the framers. And so we saw some newspapers, Kaichur News said, they had an article and said, if Jack Dale submits a second list, or a second set of names, because the list has been submitted, and the president rejects the list, he can then go ahead and unilaterally appoint the person because the Constitution gives him the right to do so. The Constitution does not give him the right to do so. It's fake news. But they're setting the basis. They tell the lie, tell it often enough, and then people are going to start repeating that, and somehow they think that Granger will, has the right to do so. And that is what's happening here. And it is something 
if not resolved properly, that would cause this country major unrest, derailing the economy even more and everything else. Because people, this is a different era. And I don't care whether the president threatens people because they have a constitutional right in this country to protest peacefully. And so I saw his speech to the army, telling them to get ready for these, these protests. This is the same president who was opposed to using the army to fight crime. Same president. And he tells people, get ready, the soldiers, to do that. The soldiers must be told that they have a duty to the Constitution and to the Defense Act, not to the partisan instructions if they come outside the law of the president. Because people have a constitutional right to protest in this country. No amount of intimidation will deter us from fighting that, for that right. And so, different era, but that will happen if, 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 if they persist in this regard. Because that means we're not going to have fair elections in the future. And that's vital to us. And we don't ask the, for help from the international community in our politics in the PVP. All we ask is for them to be just as vocal about the other issues they talk on. When, when these clear signals of breaches of our constitution are taking place, they need to speak out because they say this is good governance. How could it be good governance when the president kept the <coughs> four names were submitted from the judiciary <coughs> to him and he now says the attorney general tries to change the interpretation. I said to him, I was faced with the same situation. A judge was recommended from the GSC, who was the head of the YSM, the Young Socialist Movement of the PNC. And I had grave concerns that a person so political would be appointed a judge, the recommendations. And I, sent, I had to send it back. And then they persisted and I had to appoint the person because the 2001 constitution was changed to say the president shall act upon the advice of the JSC, not me. Before that, prior to that, it had me act. It says shall. And so I had to do that. I had no discretion. Now they're saying he has a discretion. And so we have a differently, we'll have a differently constituted JSC now. Let us see if they will, that JSC will change the recommendations that came to the president. Because if that happens, nobody will want to go forward as judges. Nobody would want to go forward. And when an attorney general openly speaks about we put them there, they got to um, support us. He talks about it openly, about judges that we, he, uh, maybe I should translate for our colleagues in the diplomatic court that he has put them there, therefore they should give decisions in his favor. This must give decisions. And we've seen some very unhealthy things happening in our judiciary, where it seems as though the government has preference. They call and they say, that's too long, the case, we, we can't wait so long. And then they get an early hearing and they get the cases um, decided. Contrary, there are two parties often in these things. What about the private party, the other party? They have, should have expectation of fair process and hearing in, this, in these matters. I'm sure if the private party had asked for early hearing, they wouldn't get it. So the government must not be treated preferentially. We waited that, the DDL matter, we waited 10 years. And we, we couldn't argue that we, it's preference. We had to wait on the process to be completed. Because we, the government has, should be seen in the same light as an ordinary citizen before the judiciary. I can go to when Carville Duncan was told to demit the office, they would give him another job and he refused. He was told, I don't want blood on my carpet. This is a holder of a constitutional post being threatened. And how can this not be dangerous for our future? 
Because first of all, people, I'm not going to talk about crime today. I'm talking about they have to feel free to invest. And they have to feel that if they put their money here and they run into conflict with the government, they'll get a hear for, fair hearing from the judiciary. And if those signals are not sent, then it will also affect the economy, well-being, investments, everything else. Parking meter, uh, maybe I should just move on. I'm taking too long already. Okay? And sugar, our, our position is clear. We have said, you don't close a, a small operation without going through the process, much less an industry that contributes so much to GDP, to our foreign currency earning. It has a systemic impact. This is not just about a company, it's about an industry. So the least you could do is have a feasibility study, an economic study. Um, I, the, the study. Secondly, the, a social impact study. You're gonna have many people affected. And then that you wanna show that you have alternatives that would occupy or allow people to get jobs, people, the, the economy, the activities that you lose, the loss of output that you lose from sugar will be recaptured elsewhere. The loss of foreign currency will be recaptured elsewhere through another alternate activity. That is the purpose of doing these studies. So they've said, we're not doing any study because we've made the decision already. And that is what we're opposed to. We're opposed about this capricious thing with the arguments that they cannot, there is no fiscal space. I said this to the president and I don't wanna go through it here, but how you can find the fiscal space to deal with sugar. And if we saw a reasoned position on sugar, then we can sit at the table but it's, they come to the meetings, and I think we just want us as a fig leaf at the meetings to say they're consulting. Already preconceived notions, and forging ahead at all costs, which will create turmoil. This is not just like a private business. It, so many things depend on, on sugar in these communities. And so we, we are going to keep up the fight here. Um, oil and gas, we hear all sorts of signals. And today is not, I would like at some point in time to talk at length about our views on this. But clearly, Sean Sham was just saying me to me that you, we got the Dutch disease even before the oil come, all the sectors collapsing. And normally you get Dutch disease after. But it is this way of talking about oil and gas as though it's the solution to everything else. And we are just waiting for that to happen and that it would solve everything else. And so we don't need to work on anything else. And that kind of philosophy damages long-term well-being of a country. Because you have many countries that have had major oil inflows or huge, huge inflows of revenue, resource windfalls, yet they are now very poor. They have high levels of poverty. And you know they, they have some very narrow sectors. So on the industry itself, we believe that government has limited capacity at this point in time and should focus on two things, basically, ensuring the industry is properly regulated, and that means looking that we are getting our fair share, looking through the numbers, etc., making sure that the costs are the lowest costs that the ExxonMobil can get for a particular good or service, because if they do that, then the bottom line would be bigger, which we will share. So intensive building the capacity to ensure that that happens. Ensuring that there's strong environmental regulations. 
that ExxonMobil meets all our environmental and safety standards, etc. That sort of thing that government should build capacity for now. Secondly, it should focus on managing the stream of revenue and nothing else in the short term because it doesn't have capacity even to implement a public sector investment program, much less to want to get involved in activities of supplying services that the private sector could do. That is where our private sector, they should leave those opportunities for the private sector. Well, in the long run, you could probably start changing some of those dynamics, but right now, those are the two most important things. And so building the capacity to do the first activity, and the second one, how do we manage the inflows? And there are some critical questions that have to be asked outside of the creation of the Sovereign Wealth Fund. But about how these proceeds get integrated into our core economy without destroying the productivity or the well-being of the other sectors, which is often the case through an appreciation, appreciating real exchange rate. How do you manage the inflows that it doesn't do that? Because, as I said before, if the depreciating currency like we have now is a boost, then an appreciating currency is a disincentive to production. And it tends to hit agriculture and manufacturing hardest. They get hit hard. So, so that is what we do. So if you decide, for example, we get the in a flow seat, $100 million. If you decide to save all of it, it has one implication for the budget. If you decide to spend all of it, it has another implication for the budget. If you decide to pay down your debts using the proceeds, it has an, a, a, another set of implications. If you decide to use it for social welfare, all of it, then there are other implications. If you use, decide to, to expand recurrent revenue um, expenditure, it has major long-term implications. Or capital side, focus on expansion of infrastructure. Each of these ways of spending the resources, have, they have a different impact on, on different variables. And we don't see that nuance kind of reasoning from the government. Because unless you have that nuance reasoning, then you're going to end up with, oh, we got all the money now, spend it all, destroying everything. It's almost like, like anecdotal from a day-to-day -day kind of thing. You hear one thing one day, another thing another day, We're building this now, refinery, somebody interested, Crab Island, all of those things are smoke screen. And that's my worry. And the part, so, so let me conclude. I think I've been going on for too long, of course. So let me conclude. The remissions, the remissions, I, you see they keep cutting it. But remissions, if you reduce remissions, the remissions are not for friends and family of the PBP. That's what they used to say, $55 billion of it in 2015. Um, when they got into office. It's come down now. But when we look at the cuts, the only growing area by over a billion dollars is government agencies and government officers. They've cut everything else. For diplomats, for, for um, remigrants, they're cutting remissions for the private sector, everyone else. Now that is if the remissions are part of the incentive regime for production, you cut them, you're, you're removing incentive, and it's effective a, a tax, well, it's not tax, it's removing an incentive. So for example, if, if um, a remind, let me don't use a remind one. Uh, I give an example, you're producing a fork, and copper is used to produce the fork, but we can't zero rate copper because you have multiple use for copper, but this, we want to help this particular manufacturer. You can't zero rate the item, and often the CET wouldn't allow you. You remit the tax on, on, on copper for that particular manufacturer as an input. And so, that's how, if you remove that, that sort of remission, then the cost of production will go up. 
And it, I don't have a problem where there is wastage and where people rip off the system. They get remissions and they don't do what they're supposed to do. So, so if, say, one of the companies they get a bunch of remission and they, they misuse it, that's by all means enforce it. But if you take as a principle to reduce it, you're putting more trouble, you're creating disincentives to the, to the private sector, and it's effective the attacks. We, got, we have to, we have a policy on that. The head of GRE, let me tell you, if they don't change this way head of GRE appears with the Minister of Finance and all of these things, we have to draft provisions in the future to ensure that you insulate the head of GRE because we never did it and we thought, we thought maybe this would always be the case, that if you don't give political instructions, that political instructions will never be given. Now, it, GRE has become an arm of the politics of this government. And in the future, if they don't change that, we'll have to draw when, and I'm talking about future when the PPP, if the PPP were to get back in office, or when it gets back, to draft serious provisions to insulate that position by law um, from, but these people, they don't even respect the law, from, from, um, from making political decisions and going after people politically. We'd have to re-examine every case where there's an allegation on, of unfair tax treatment or excess, excessive action on the part of officers. Because if they don't know, and I'm gonna make a public statement about this, that anyone who acts capriciously bullies the private sector, etc., we're prepared to review cases in the future. Because by all means, we'll support every revenue officer to go after taxes that are evaded. But they have a, a civilized, impartial way, a professional way of doing this. And any time we find a departure from that, then this will not. We'd have to roll back the discretionary powers of any agency outside of acts of the judiciary. I'm talking about the, the VAT and the ability to stop anyone leaving Guyana without a court order because you have outstanding VAT payments. VAT payments for both, most businessmen are it's a, in a flux. It's always there. You have, you, you're always either paying and waiting for a refund or something else. At any point in time in the cycle, you could be owing VAT. That means government could stop you any time from traveling. That's a fundamental right. That's a fundamental right. They, we'd have to look at all of these things. People ask me, you, we, PPP says you're gonna revisit a lot of things and remove. And let me tell you the things we've decided on already. There are many others that we're looking at. We can't be this definitive. But that 2% final tax is gone. We're going back to status quo ante. The 10% tributary tax, the 2% final tax, heavy duty equipment, removing the taxes all again from them. So that would be a boost to, to agriculture, to forestry, to mining, all of the productive sectors. All of this taxes on building material and the forestry sector is gone. The agriculture inputs, the sub medical supplies and services, the education sector, um, the MMA fees, all of these things, water and electricity, duty um, fat on data, within a short time, they will be reversed. And people say, but if you reverse all these things, where would you get the revenue to manage the country? If you change your philosophy and how you see the state, the, the, the economy, who are the drivers of the economy, you can keep the economy growing without resorting to this. We, had, we didn't have to increase the 200 fees by 6,000% and introduce all these measures, and the economy was growing well under the PPP. You can do it without doing that. You have to pay back more on these wasteful expenditures. Just collecting 
putting pressures, and it does have no economic thought because there is a disincentive to, prime, to development and production, these taxes, and secondly, they create more loss of welfare, more poverty. Which government wants that? To generate more poverty and loss of welfare, and, but they don't see it, they don't see it, and, and, and the loss of incentives to the business community. So a lot of those things will have to, to go, including the zero-rated foodstuff. Um, I think I've spoken long enough because I um, branched off on some of the other issues, but I hope that the international community too will not allow itself, and I'm not saying it is, but we said this to the group that came in from the United Nations, that this government talks social cohesion, and when you look at its action, they're designed to divide our people and to create more disharmony in our society. That by supporting executive now action, because they're using that ministry as a slush fund for travels in the interior, etc., we're undermining the constitutional agency that was set up to promote greater harmony among our people, which is the Ethnic Relations Commission. That should be given the support, not this, the, the ministry. Similarly, when people, there is this blanket thing about corruption, you know, and, and we, they disguise everything through these public statements about billions stolen. Somebody needs to act as, and for example, one of the diplomats should say, you have said, that the PPP stole $306 billion. Can you tell us how, per annum? And there was $28 billion of procurement fraud per annum. That is, the, every week they say that. Well, if the, every year you, was, you had $28 billion of procurement fraud, can you tell us just for two years which projects they came from? Where? Disaggregate them and let's see. And if you go behind those, the fake news and the political slogans, you will see how hollow much of what they're talking about. So we were not perfect, and there are lots of things we have to address. But, uh, uh, so we admit our deficiencies. But the way, the only thing that they have going for them now, these, these public, um, issues where they talk about corruption and maligning people and they're going to get more repressive but it's part of the reality of Guyana and we'll have to deal with it. So thank you very much. Thank you. We have a second mic and uh, Dr. Jagan has agreed uh, to Dr. Jagir. <laughs> That's the second, the second one. <laughs> I'm sounding like a minister. And uh, Dr. Jagger is willing to have an interaction with you if you have any questions and answers. <coughs> yes. Add to the interaction. People want to get home and the baby. <coughs> no, it could be that you, yeah, you, you covered so many areas uh, that 
Distinguished guests, good evening. My name is Bobby Chatboro. Um, I'm a business person. I'm in the manufacturing sector. And my product is coatings. We do manufacture coatings, which means paint of all substance. I know Mr. Javier didn't want to speak on the crime situation. But I feel I'm forced to ask a question. Um, how can this country progress when the kind of situations plaguing our businesses, society, and foreign investment? What are some of your recommendations to this problem? And I want to let you know, the last eight years, I had to go and set another business up in St. Lucia. And today it's up and running very successfully. All because of the fact. I work very hard here, I work here, and I'm concerned, very concerned. Thank you. Anyone else? It's, it, it's stunning because, because they, um, it's so counterproductive. It is so counter, who thinks up about this sort of thing? Who thinks about this? You know, so we hear all of these things about calling on the president to review these measures. There hasn't been a single year when I was Minister of Finance, when I was president, and even when I left office up to 2014, I have not sat in a meeting and gone through every single tax measure that we introduced to do two things, to test their impact on the economy, of course the need to enhance the need for revenue, and, and welfare. Three questions you have to ask yourselves. You can't allow, Jordan said, FAT is an instrument of fiscal policy, not social policy. As though the purpose of a government is to collect revenue, not to enhance national well-being, to create wealth, to expand you know, employment, etc. That is what he said. And this comes out of that philosophy. Oh, it's only about revenue, so we're not going to give the relief. But a lot of people who are aspiring to build houses and moving up to the middle class, etc., that is where it hit them the hardest. And so to ban vehicles, 
eight, over the you know over eight years old or under eight yes over eight years old again hit a group of people who were just struggling to start owning something when people start owning something you see the difference in their lives because they start accumulating and it, it you know they start expanding their pride and their energy and they become more productive and stuff they've taken away that incentive from so many people when, when, you know, and I can go through a whole list of things where they took away incentives from people, the school kids and this group and that group, pensioners. The pensioners were causing us, uh, like, the water and electricity subsidy, maybe about $600 million per year, the, the two. We now spend um, 200 odd on maintenance of the Prime Minister loan, $220 million a year. Equivalent, with, with the 50% increase in salaries that the 27 persons took, that would be equivalent to paying the water subsidy alone, not the electricity, of all the 44,000 pensioners. So it decides who, who you're working for. So that kind of thing though makes no sense absolutely. But it's not only the mortgage relief, it is what they have done to the housing sector through now putting taxes on all the, the building materials. And you know, so prices will go up. And this is the, 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 the problem. If it made sense, you know, it's easy to, to support it or disagree with it. If it doesn't make sense, you don't even know what to, to argue against. It's, so, so this is a tough one. The crime situation, yes. And it would be hypocritical of us to say we did not have a challenge. We had a challenge too. But we were clear about certain things. We had clarity. We did not diminish, look at, look at the priority of this government. So the DPP asked for money, this is a constitutional agency, the government, the first act of this government in parliament was to pass a law to say that some constitutional agencies will have financial autonomy now, including the DPP's office. So, financial autonomy. In exercising the financial autonomy, they asked for, for um, a budget. They cut the budget. So. It's, it's purely nonsensical to say you have financial autonomy and they cut the budget. So that's one. Then they put a hundred million dollars in the put in the attorney general's budget, the minister of justice. He has no constitutional right to deal with prosecutions. That's done by the DPP. She is in the constitution in charge of prosecution. The Attorney General, he should look after our civil rights, puts a hundred million dollars in his budget for special prosecutors. They then went ahead and hired people from his chambers and Harmon's chambers to be some of these special prosecutors. We don't know how much they're paying them, large sums of money. And guess who the target is? Not to strengthen prosecution against drug traffickers or murderers or rapists or armed robbers, but to come after the people. So that is where it's been done. SOKU, which was set up under the PPP to support the Money Laundering Act and that unit that was created, FIU, it was set up for that, to go after organized crime, has suddenly now, they. The focus is, I'm getting to your question. Yeah, I'm getting to it. I'm going from the bottom up, right? So, so that is. Yeah, I, I, and early, early. <laughs> no, 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 it's not bad. Just, yeah, so, so I'm just saying that Soku now, look at Soku's attention. Soku's attention is only on political people, ostensibly for this biggest act of corruption that took place there. And so we are losing $306 billion 
We have all of these people smuggling billions of dollars of gold, and your biggest prosecution now is, is Prado Guilty. And so the focus as they're supporting policemen, giving instructions. We know the instructions were political, that when they had meetings with the head of Soko, we know that they celebrated after. We have and 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 somebody is gonna get in trouble who issued a public statement because you have people who are willing to testify who was present at that, that celebration. Imagine when a politician meets, this is like the FBI in the United States, and the White House goes to the FBI to celebrate a or some, or someone being prosecuted or arrested. And in the presence of some foreign, foreign people too, meet to do that. So that's, that's the pur purpose. The signals are all wrong. The focus is there. And then constantly, the minister gives instructions to the police. He says, um, people must be charged next week. The DPP has, the police haven't finished the investigation. The DPP has not ruled on it. But he, now, he then says who to be charged and when. He then says that about the police, to the police complaints authority. He gives instructions about his crime. And it's all about agendas, etc. The focus is not on crime and criminality. And even when they do that, the lack of transparency, the 70 odd people that were released from prison, every country and every citizen has a right to know who was released. We try, we write them, we put a, a paper in parliament requesting the names, and they did not give us. They refused to tell us who the president pardoned. So this should be public information. But we found out that it, they may have, not the cell phone teams, thieves as we were told, but some of the clients of some of the lawyers who are ministers now on that list, who are in there for hardcore activities. So they're out on the road. You have a lot of them are getting back into some of these things. This is it. The president tells the police, don't do this, don't do that. He gives instructions all the time. The, the act says you cannot give operational instructions. You have to give policy instructions. They're giving operational instructions. So the whole focus is on that. No, absolutely no sympathy for the criminal. At least the police knew which side we stood on. They're confused in many cases. So in that tone, it's crime will grow. And as the economy gets worse, it will get even harder. As the economy gets worse, more and more petty crime. The, um, the addressing of the critic, the contract with Exxon Mobil. A lot of these, the contract reflected the law, the Petroleum Act. So it was done in accordance with that. That act had not been revised for a very long time. It pre predated us. But if you were to ask me today, um, now that we are on the map as a country that has oil, if you will go with a contract of that nature for new entrants, I may say no. But at that time, it had to be in attractive enough I believe, to allow people to want to come and drill for oil. And so sometimes when you, you establish now, so from the equity perspective, maybe in, you can in future get a greater share of revenue. But given the history and how hard it was to even get people to drill because a single well can cost $150 million and we had to push them, push them. If the, the incentive was not great enough, it would have probably killed that activity and not be an encouragement. That's one. But, but it's on the transparency side, but nevertheless, on the equity, we have a duty now, the point I made, to see what we're eligible for, that we get it. So that means a clear idea about cost. So if the government says to ExxonMobil, 
we want you to buy services from this person and he can produce the cost come, as they're inclined to do now what I heard and that person sells the particular service at a rate higher than what ExxonMobil can procure elsewhere and if it doesn't bring other benefits for example linkages in the economy then we are cutting our future source of revenue so we have to first of all make sure that we don't give instructions to ExxonMobil that will reduce our future revenue that will push up their costs and reduce our future revenue. and two then that we are comfortable with their books that they are going to competitive arrangements to get the lowest cost for all the services that they use because if we ensure and we have to build a whole capacity for that we don't have it now accountants forensic auditors not of a different kind <laughs> and and etc to look at that capacity then you can ensure that what we have now that we get all that we have in the contract now because even though you get a share it could disappear quickly if the costs are, are pushed up. Transparency, the contract itself may not, may not force them, but other laws in the country. So our move to be part of the EITI will allow, ensure that ExxonMobil meets some standards here in terms of payment to government and a whole range, at least on the financial transparency side so that proceeds could be traced, etc. We'd have to toughen our integrity legislation. Right now, they talk a lot about corruption. They voted against making tax records and the integrity commission statements public. They voted, they have not responded to our calls for, to have an international company investigate the assets of all former government officials as well as current ones then it's easy. You can trace who has what overseas, get a specialized company. They have not done that. They could easily do that rather than spend the money and start a higher company. So, so do, 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 those two things. And now I saw a amendment. So the Integrity Commission was disbanded. They fired the staff, took all the documents over. So we don't have an Integrity Commission now to submit any statements though. And, and the, the, the government just recently came up with a code of conduct for ministers and members of parliament to amend the integrity commission law to put in a code of conduct. And guess who are the enforcers? The president and the vice president, Nangamutu. Or not, well, Nangamutu and the others. Imagine the executive, you amend the integrity commission law, which should be a separate agency from the executive to put the minister, the president, and the others. So we have to fight that deal in parliament. I saw that amendment that coming up. This is the sort of thing. Making sure that you can track, because I am very uncomfortable with the statements we hear. We are reviewing contracts. The minister keeps saying, I can't tell the cabinet everything. I can't tell the country everything. A minister goes to the press conference and says, I, I don't want everybody to know this business. This is somehow our business, and we get a stage in for That's not healthy, and so you're right. We have to strengthen the transparency provision. Protection of the environment, again, I, that was one of the questions I asked ExxonMobil. If you have a spill, and the level of the spill, and what's your capacity, and they told me. But that should be our standards, and they have to meet our standards. Of course, you can't make the standards beyond what is internationally acceptable. So that is not part of the contract itself, but that is a requirement. Anyone who operates here must meet our environmental standard. The parking meter. Parking meter, we have been opposed to this a long time back, way before the councillors came. We have a councillor called Coupen, who's been speaking out. I see the FC councillor gets a lot of the credit, but he has been for months and months speaking out against this. We held a public forum at which he spoke at length. That was since last year, August or so, to explaining their parking meter contract and how, how corrupt it was, etc. And very little was heard about it. And then um, 
So he evolved, we have it now, it's a corrupt transaction, no public tender, etc. And it, it, there's nothing else to describe it. But I see this government is divorcing. You hear all sorts of things that, oh, we are unhappy about it, etc. If they're unhappy, they can do something about it. But we believe they're benefiting from the proceeds, Congress please, from our information. And so, let me tell you, the parking meter would not have seen, the contract couldn't be effectively realized without the passage, the minister signing the bylaws. These huge bylaws almost overnight, no review, he signed it. Then the attorney general says, I still have to review it. But it's signed and in effect. We haven't heard anything much more about that. But the, the whole contract could have not been executed had that not been done. And the president says, this is not our, we don't want to intervene in local government issues. But then he orders a reduction. Didn't order a review. The Ministry of Finance was sent the contract. And the Ministry of Finance said, cancel this in their analysis. It's bad. It's illegal. The government repudiated its own contract, the, its own advice from the Ministry of Finance, because there are other issues at play here. And so they will hope to outlast people, because there are lots of hidden flows here, lots of hidden flows. And so we'll have to deal with that, because as I said before, if bylaws can be passed by the government, bylaws can be changed. And um, the first one about what he asked, that guy asked about who went out and said, I didn't answer his question. It's the oil strategy and whether our, our relationship with the multilaterals would be compromised. I don't think so. I think the multilateral agencies and foreign governments, they hopefully, we all want the same thing, which is an oil sector that is transparently managed and that's contributing to well-being in the country and wealth creation. And so I don't think we'll have any compromise or any conflict with, with those countries. The, the geopolitical issue is always a concern, but I don't want to explore that publicly here now. I sound like Trotman, but not on the oil contract, just the politics. Thank you very much. And uh, now we have some. Any another question? Oh, did I miss something? Yeah. And I'm going to ask the second vice president of the GMSA.